Washington Merry-Go-Round. Washington, February 15, 1940. A long series of backstage conversations, some informal, some obscure, have preceded the European peace trip of Under Secretary of State Wells. Some have been carried on by accredited diplomats, some by purely unofficial envoys, and some have actually gotten into the State Department's hair. Here is a description of one confidential peace overture in which the President was interested, which also sheds light on the Rose of Veltro with John L. Lewis. In late September, about three weeks after the war broke out, W. R. Davis, the international oil man, was visiting with John L. Lewis and Walter Jones of Pittsburgh in the latter's apartment. Davis told of various conversations he had had with Hitler. Davis had been selling Mexican oil to Germany, was intimate with high-placed Nazis, and spoke of their ideas for permanent European peace. I think the president ought to know about this, remarked John L. Lewis and went into an anteroom where he called the president. He had no difficulty getting him and said, Mr. President, there's a man here I think you ought to see. He's got some important ideas on the war. So Roosevelt made an appointment. British Secret Service. When Davis arrived at the White House, he was introduced to Adolf Bull, Assistant Secretary of State and noticed during his conversation with Roosevelt that Bull was busy taking notes. This caused Davis to protest, I thought this was to be a confidential conversation between you and me. Oh, Adolf's all right, and the president brushed the protest aside. In the end, Roosevelt suggested that Davis fly back to Germany, get any concrete peace proposals which Hitler might have, and report back. So Davis caught the clipper for Portugal. The first step was Bermuda, where a plain clothes man tapped him on the shoulder and said, Come along with me. I'd like to talk to you. He turned out to be a member of the British Secret Service, who warned Davis to go back to the United States or else his passport would be lifted. He seemed to know all about the Davis peace trip. However, Davis raised such a fuss that he was finally allowed to proceed though not until after the clipper had been kept 24 hours in Bermuda waiting for him. From that point on, the British did everything possible to handicap Davis, even cancelling his passage from Portugal so that he had to take a plane to Morocco and then on to Germany. But at last, Davis got to Berlin, interviewed the highest Nazi leaders, and flew back to the United States, arriving in late October. With him, he carried several long, closely written pages in German, giving the ideas on which Hitler was willing to discuss peace. Davis took an apartment in the Mayflower and began to translate the document. Then, suddenly he discovered two men sitting outside his door. They were G-men. At this point, Walter Jones, a close friend of Davis, went to the management to complain. There he discovered that not merely two G-men, but five were in the hotel and that they had trailed Davis from the moment he registered. Apparently, the British Secret Service and the Justice Department were working closely together, and neither for peace. So John L. Lewis phoned Bull to complain about the manner in which a man who had undertaken a confidential mission, at the request of the President, was being hounded by detectives. Bull invited him to come down to the State Department. No, replied Lewis. I won't come down to your office and talk with all those microphones around. I'll come out to your place. So Lewis visited Bell at his palatial mansion and talked to him on the front porch. A day or so later, Davis presented the German peace plan formally to Bull for transmission to the president. Present also was Walter Jones, but no one else. It was emphasized that the entire conversation was strictly confidential. This was at noon. Later that day, Davis and Jones motored to Harrisburg, Pa, where a phone call from Washington reached them. The State Department tells me that you and W. R. Davis have brought a peace proposal from Germany, the newsman asked Jones. That was how interested the State Department, at that time, was in plans for peace. Unquestionably, the State Department boys were taking their cues directly from the British and the British did not want peace. 
since then, the president himself has taken a much more active hand in the matter, and unquestionably peace is more important in his mind than any other problem facing the country or the world today. I hope this revised version is clearer. If you have any specific questions or if there's anything else you'd like assistance with, feel free to let me know. Republican Go Round Grand old party leaders in the Rocky Mountain states, Montana, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and Arizona, are taking a leaf from their Midwestern colleagues and plan to vote at the Republican National Convention as a solid bloc. A similar movement has been discussed by New England leaders and may shortly get underway. For a self-professed disinterested candidate, Senator Arthur Vandenberg is displaying a lot of undercover activity. He has just named Ralph B. Innes of Kansas City his manager for the southwestern states. Although Senator Bob Taft will go to the convention as Ohio's favorite son, actually, he will not control Ohio's delegation. That goes for Governor Bricker, too. The state organization will boss the delegation and will be free to swing to whomever it wishes after the first ballot. Definitely slated for a place on the Iowa delegation is W.J. Goodwin, Des Moines banker farmer, who was chairman of the subcommittee that wrote the farm section of the Glenn Frank report. Jim Farley During the early days of the Roosevelt administration, Jim Farley was one of the bitter targets for the left-wing New Dealers. They disliked him intensely. But today, it is just the opposite. Listen, for instance, to SEC Commissioner Leon Henderson, generally considered a left-winger. Over at the Mayflower the other day, says Leon, the newsmen were taking pictures. Jim Farley and I were there, and they got a picture of us together. Somebody from the sidelines started kidding me about being a candidate. So I turned to Jim and said, let's join forces, Jim. And he said, oh. K. Leon, which end of the ticket do you want? Dot. Jim Farley is a damn good man. He's not the best man in sight for president, by a long shot, but he'd make a whale of a good vice president. He's on the up and up. No pressure politics. Whenever Jim wants to place somebody in a job, and he gets an awful lot of people to place, and some of them push him pretty hard, he doesn't come to me and say, for Pete's sake, Leon, put this fellow on, will you? None of that. Just a straight letter, like anybody else. No more pressure than, than Senator Barber, a Republican. Here Henderson tapped a letter on his desk from Senator Barber. No. Jim is all right.